week three of our series, Rediscovering Christmas, because one of the saddest things I think about the Christmas season, and it's not just the Christmas season, the holiday season, I'll stretch it out a little bit, from, from, and maybe you didn't know this, but from Thanksgiving all the way through to New Year's, do you realize there are going to be more people in depression and actually more suicides happen during this time period than any other time period? And it just is symptomatic of the world we live in. Because we have so many difficulties, we have so many discouragements that come in our lives, and, and what it says about our world today is we really don't know how to exist in them, or we don't believe that promise that God gives us. Because remember, I talked about this in the week one of the series, the Christmas story is about this incredible, un, uh, incomprehensible, uh, unbelievable, impossible promise that started off 4,000 years ago. Um, plus uh, a little over 4,000 years ago, and it started off with this guy named Abraham, and it wasn't about a young couple who were looking to figure out what they're going to do about having this baby. It was with an older couple who thought they would never have a child, and God was so amazing, and last week we took a look at the fact that God demonstrates his love towards us in that while I was still a sinner, while you were still a sinner, Christ, he died for us, and that's the whole story of Christmas, and today I want to point out some truths, hopefully, that that, that sort of wrap this thing together. We're going to be in the book of Matthew uh, today, and predominantly in the book of Matthew. I promise you today is not one of those days that we will go for a little bit in Romans, but I'm going to be predominantly in Matthew in the story. In fact, Matthew, if you have your Bibles, in Matthew chapter 1, or you can follow along, it's going to be on screen. This is what Matthew says, and it's so amazing. He starts off and he says, this is how, in case you wanted to know, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. And I want to stop there for just a minute and, and, and say this. And this is so important to us, um, especially if you're maybe a little bit, I'm not sure if I really believe all this, I'm not sure if I grasp all this, I would say this, I want you to know that Matthew lets us know right up front, I mean, he gave the genealogy of Jesus, if you read the first couple of verses, but right in verse 18, as soon as he's done with his genealogies, he comes out and says, hey, I want you to know right up front, as a Hebrew man, as a Jewish man, I want you to know that I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah. And that's important because that's the basis of everything he's going to teach in the rest of his book. And so he doesn't wait to the end until he reveals the truth at the end of like, well, Jesus rose from the dead. He says right before you get into anything, he says, I want you to know right now at the very birth, Jesus is the Messiah, which leads me to two things we have to take care of right up front. First of all, um, we talk about the word the two words there that I've highlighted, Messiah. Um, if you grew up around church, you may know this to be true. Um, it may not be shocking to you, but the word Messiah is actually the Hebrew word for which we are more familiar with the Greek word Christ. Now, some of you, if you didn't grow up around church or maybe you came to church and nobody ever explained this to you, Christ isn't the last name of Jesus. It wasn't Mary and Joseph Christ and their son Jesus, right? Hopefully you knew that. If you didn't know that, don't feel bad because sometimes we don't explain that. The word Christ is actually the same word Messiah. It's the equivalent in Greek for the Hebrew word Messiah, which means anointed one. This is the Lord's Christ. He's the, the anointed one. He's the Savior. And so that's the first thing I want you to know. The second thing I want you to know is Jesus. And, and, and some of you are like, I got this. I've heard about him forever. I came to church. Yeah, but here's the problem. Um, and maybe this is what's going to really sort of destroy some of your Christmas magic. I hope it doesn't, but um, there are certain things that we come to believe that we didn't know. But Jesus is actually the trans, translation, the transliteration, actually, of the, from the Greek word for the Hebrew name. And the Hebrew name for Jesus, and you may have this really... Um, you may have this person in your life that like always wants to thrill you with how much they know about things, and so they're always calling him, instead of calling him Jesus, they call him Yeshua. And to which you might have said, like, bless you. Um, he wasn't sneezing. Jesus is Yeshua in Hebrew. Now, here's what you need to know. In Hebrew and in Greek, they don't have J's. There is no J. I know, it's, it's in English we have the J. And so we take Yeshua... And we translate it and modernize it. And actually, Yeshua is actually Joshua, right? Now, your Christmas songs wouldn't sound quite as cool with a three-syllable name, would it? It's easier on two-syllable. It rhymes a lot more. Jesus rhymes a lot more than, than Yeshua. 
or uh, Joshua. Those are harder to do. I'm serious. Um, but um, if you don't have your, ears, uh, your prayers answered, maybe because you're praying in the wrong name, you're praying, praying for the wrong person, it's Yeshua. Uh, I'm just kidding on that. Uh, so you guys are like, he's serious? No, I'm not serious on that. Um, but the importance of that name, and I really want you to stay with me on this one, Jesus is Joshua. And you say, well, what's the big deal? Because we always think Jesus is Jesus. And there's an importance in this name because that's what this text is really going to focus on. That's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. Because Jesus, you always thought was this Jesus, but he's really Joshua. Because what the Israelites knew they needed and what God was sending them through this promise was not just a Jesus, another Yeshua. He is Joshua. And what do we know about Joshua? Well, you have to go back to your knowledge of the Old Testament and Joshua is the guy who comes after Moses. Now, Moses was the great lawgiver. He was the great leader. He took the people out of Egypt. That's great. But what the people didn't need was another Moses. The people of Israel didn't want another rule. They didn't want another law. What they needed was a Joshua. Joshua was the warrior. Joshua was the conqueror. He was the mighty general, the leader of people, and he led them into the promised land. And so when it says here that it is Jesus, the birth of Jesus, you need to think like the people of Israel would think, and they want you to understand that the Christmas narrative is going to mean a whole lot more to you if you understand Jesus to be Joshua. And I'll explain why, because that's so important to us. Because this is what they wanted. He was that warrior, that military leader, that general, not another Moses. So he says this as we continue on in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. He says, this is how it happened. And he goes on to say this. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Now, we look at that word pledged, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but in first century it meant a lot. Because girls, by the time they were 12 to 15, would be pledged, or there would be a contract between their parents made up where they would be contracted towards marriage. 16, if a, if a woman, a girl wasn't married or pledged by 16, there was something wrong with her. And she probably was never going to get married, just to be honest with you. But this pledge was a legal contract. Their families had initiated. In fact, just to be honest with you, if you don't know this, Mary and Joseph were very rarely, does anybody ever consider them to be the same age? Now, I know when we do our little skits and plays, we always put them like a cute little couple. This is going to sound really gross, but he was like 40-something, and she was like 16 maybe. Okay? Now, why? Because a guy had to work to pay the parents off on that pledge. And he had to take a, a lot of time in their economy. So it was always older men, younger women. Older men, younger women. They had to come up with the money unless they came from a rich family. Then you might see a younger guy. But for the most part, older man, younger woman. He also, his responsibility when they were pledged during this time period, they actually were, were considered uh, betrothed or engaged. And their engagement was a little bit different because when they were engaged in first century time, they were considered married. But they didn't consummate the marriage physically. In fact, in that year, it was a year of discovery, but it was also the, the groom's job to go off, and he was to build onto his dad's property, his dad's house. He was going there to build a suitable dwelling place, which if you look in John chapter 14, it makes a lot more sense what Jesus said then. But he was building a suitable dwelling place for his bride to come and live in. And so that was what would happen. But during that year, it was a year of discovery. They were under contract. They were considered husband and wife, but they weren't going to do anything physical together. In fact, that year of discovery was to make sure that both of them were who they said they were, were going to fulfill their contract, and they weren't going to cheat on each other. And pretty much in a year's time, you could tell whether a woman was going to be faithful or not, right? Because if she got pregnant during that year, bad things happened, dude. Bad things. In fact, you know in the first century when when things like that happened, they would take them out and burn them for being unfaithful. You take them out and burn them, or you take them out and stone them. That's what they would do. Now, the good thing is that this time period, they didn't do a lot of this because they weren't following the Old Testament law as closely as they used to. Some of it was because they weren't allowed to. But he says here that she was pledged to Joseph, and what happens is she finds out, as we continue on, she finds out, it says, but before they came together physically, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And that means that she knew, but Joseph knew, 
and pretty much everybody knew. And the problem was is they came from small town Israel. They came, and it's one of those towns where everybody knows, and you know all the Christian people, they're going to call these things prayer requests, but they're going to talk about you in church, right? And they're going to talk about you, and it's going to get ugly. And this was a big deal because what did I say? They stoned you or they burned you. And she was found to be pregnant, but she was also, I think, if you were to ask at this point, if you ask Joseph, Joseph said, she's a little bit crazy. I married a crazy one. I got hooked up with a crazy chick. Okay, I was telling somebody my story last night, and I said, yeah, the girl I, I sort of was involved with before I got mar- uh, hooked up with my wife, she was one of those <laughs> loco crazy ones, you know. Um, my wife rescued me from that bad situation, and that's just, a, you have to ask me about that. She was. She was as crazy as a loon. So um, God has mercy on me sometimes in my stupidity, but th- can you imagine if you were Joseph and all the, all the guys in the room were like, now all the ladies are sympathizing with, with Mary, but all the guys in the room like, okay. I don't want to get hooked with that crazy chick. You know what I'm talking about? The crazy one. Everybody, everybody knows who they are. She had to be crazy, though, because she's going around telling people she's pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Who does that? That's just not right. And she's also spouting off things about this angel came and said this to me. And, and so that's the background for where we get to. And then verse 19, it says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. And this is so important because as we look into this, the law tells Joseph, you can't marry her. You can't marry her. The law said you have to shame her. You have to stone her. You have to burn her. You have to disregard her. You need to get her away from you. And Joseph was faithful to his law, and this became a problem for him. And that's where we find Joseph. Because he's like a crazy woman over here that I've got a relationship, but she's pregnant now. And I, I know the right thing according to the law is I'm supposed to get rid of her. I'm supposed to disown her. I don't need her in my life because she's going to make things crazy. It's already getting crazy. And it goes on to say further, we keep in verse 19, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. And, and what you find here in that phrase there, a public disgrace, is this guy Joseph being a different kind of guy. Now, he, I don't think he was crazy, but... What he was doing is, is it tells you there in, in verse 19 that he was balancing what the law requires and what grace demands. He was, he was all law, but he was also grace. And, and that's one of those hard things we as Christ followers, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Because, you know, you look at the Bible, and the Bible says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But we're supposed to love our friends, our neighbors, and everything. And it's one of those hard things because you've been around those people that are all law. They just want to hate on you. They want to tell you all the sins you do and all that kind of stuff. They don't want to have any kind of grace to help you with those things. And so the, the battle inside Joseph is this battle for law and grace. And, and he's caught between the two. And it goes on as it finishes out in verse 19. It says that he had in mind to diver- divorce her quietly. And so he's got this, this balance, what he knows the law demands, to shame her, to put her to gra- disgrace her, to, to put her away, to stone her. Because she has been caught. But grace says no love her in a way that God would love her. And, and that's one of those things that's so new and so fresh. And, and he's thinking this over, and he had in his mind to do it quietly. And so a, as it demands, what this means is he could go, as part of the offended party, he could go to the priest. He could go to the temple law, because that was the law. And he could walk into them, and he could go, hey, you know what? I want this contract nullified the contract that we had made, I want my money back. I want, I want my dignity back. I want everything back, and, and I want it on the down low. I, I, I don't want to do this to make a big deal, but I, I just want to nullify this. And it would have happened. This is what he, he was thinking about doing. And, and he could go, and he could break this contract that the, the parents had set up for them in, in, in this situation. And as we look down, verse 20, it says, but after he had considered, he, he's a thinker. He's thinking about this thing. He's got all these things, and what's great is it's not going to come down to his thinking that's going to really determine this. He considers all these things, and then it says, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, and this is where it gets crazy because, like, I don't, if you're having angel dreams, don't tell me, please, because I'm going to think you're crazy. Um, uh, but you've got to realize back then they didn't have the word of God like we have, and so they needed, they needed direct revelation from God. So God's given us his direct revelation written down now. So we don't have to depend on dreams and things like that. Those, those are things that, are, that Satan works in now. God's working through this angel, though, and this angel comes to him and appears to him in a dream. And that probably was going to scare him to death because there's no time ever that God sends an angel that doesn't terrify everybody. 
And this is what, this is what the angel begins to say. Joseph, son of David. Now, we stop there because that's so important because everybody knew this. And, he, and remember, Matthew's writing to Jewish people in his gospel account. He is Jewish, and Joseph is Jewish. And we read in the first 17 verses, or we, lo- we could have read in the first 17 verses. We didn't read those today. But in the first 17 verses, it gives Joseph's lineage all the way back through David, where David was his great, 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 great ancestor. Um, And it's important because everybody knew that the Messiah, the Christ, had to come from the line of David. So this is such an important thing that Matthew's saying here when 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 he tells us this. And the angel says, hey, I want to remind you, Joseph, who you're from. You're of the house of David. You're the son of David. This is it. And, and so he reminds him, then he says this. He says, and do not be afraid. You know why he said that? Because he was afraid. That's deep, isn't it? He was afraid. God does something sometimes, and, and, and when God works in your life, it should make you a little bit scared. Because it, 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 it's just one of those things. Angels show up in dreams. He's got this dream, and he's, he's seeing this angel. And the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about the angel, whether he was like this huge angel, whether there's lights or whatever. Just says he was an angel and he was afraid. He was afraid because things like this don't happen all the time. And for 400 plus years, God has pretty much been silent, except for he spoke to this guy named Zachariah who can't talk now. And, and things are starting to, to move, but nobody knows and he's afraid. And he says, Don't be afraid because fear is probably what's, what's driving you to break that contract, what's driving you to go towards the law and not towards grace. Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Don't be afraid of the crazy. That's what he's saying there. Don't be afraid of the crazy. You can handle the crazy. Because, and then he says this, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And that's like, Joseph, like I heard Mary say this, so I think she's a little crazy. And now I know, like, I might be a little on the crazy side too. And he's sitting there, like, remember, he's thinking about these things. He doesn't know, understand what's going on. And when you get to this, what I want, to, I want you to see here, and hang here for, for a second with me, what he just told Joseph in this dream was the concept of what we hold to as a doctrine, a great doctrine. It's the doctrine of what we call the virgin birth. But this is where it gets a little bit crazy, because the idea of Joseph, the Messiah, coming from the line of David, everybody understood that. Messiah had to be from David's line. But this whole craziness that it's a woman conceived by uh, a son by the Holy Ghost, that virgin birth thing, that's sort of crazy. Uh, in fact, no one was expecting that. And you, you say, well, wait a minute, he's going to quote Isaiah. And a couple of verses down, he does quote Isaiah. And if you go back to the Isaiah passage and you look in the original languages where it says, behold, a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son, if you go into the original languages, that word for virgin is really a vague word that doesn't mean exactly virgin. It just means young lady. It can be translated young lady, female. It's very indistinct. It's very, now we know because of hindsight, our translators knew it was going to be a virgin, so they put the word virgin in there. It makes sense. But to the Jews, they had just the Old Testament. They didn't realize the context, and so it wasn't on their radar The radar said he's going to be of the line of David, but it never said anything about being this whole virgin thing. That was crazy for them. In fact, it's not, it's it's a Gentile thing. It's not a Jewish thing. The virgin birth. See, if you go back through the study of the Greeks and the Romans, when they talked about their gods, and that's the culture that was dominating their society that day, when they talked about their gods, their gods of Mount Olympus, their gods that, that did all, their gods were mean gods. And they had this tendency in their stories to have these gods come and take on the form of a man. And they would come in and have relationships with beautiful women. And in their story, the the god Zeus would have this woman that he would have an affair with. And he would create an offspring from this this relationship, this one-time event. And you would have a guy like Hercules, if you didn't know the story of Hercules. The myth says that Hercules is the son of Zeus when Zeus came down one time in human form and had relations with a woman and so when Matthew tells us this story you know Joseph's sitting back going wait a minute this is crazy this is crazy this doesn't happen this isn't even this isn't even Jewish thing 
This is a Gentile thing. In fact, here's what I would say about it. For Matthew to have manufactured, and this, is, this, this goes back to what I said before in, in previous sermons, this sort of makes the whole story of Christmas a little bit unbelievable. It does. Because, you know, it wasn't normal. It was, and to the Jews, they're sitting back going, wait a minute, we don't need this. And that's the problem. See, for Matthew uh, to have manufactured this story, which, which people who don't believe the truth of the word of God would say, maybe you're here, one of those people like, I don't know about this. This is crazy. For, for Matthew to have made this up, or, or for that matter, for anybody else to have manufactured the story of the virgin birth, it doesn't help the Christmas story. You know that, right? It doesn't make it more believable. In fact, it hurts it because it's weird. It makes it less believable. In fact, nobody is going to believe it. Which leads me to say this. The only reason, practically speaking, that Matthew would include this in his Christmas narrative, this first story, is that it has to be true. Because otherwise it hurts the story. Do you get what I'm saying? There's no other way Matthew would put this in there unless it is true, and he was sure of it. And that's how I know there's a virgin birth. Because to put it in there, it's not a Jewish thing. It wasn't even something on their radar. They weren't looking for a virgin birth ever. They were looking for a birth in the line of David, but not a virgin birth. Yet Matthew tells us, if we go on in the story in verse number uh, 21, he says, she will give birth to a son. That's that crazy thing. And you are to <laughs> give him the name, and here's where the, the, the music ramps up a little bit. You know, it gets real tense here, and the drum roll happens, and everybody's on the edge of the seats, and it says, you are to give him the name Yeshua, Joshua, Joshua. And that's what the angel's telling him. He's saying, hey, this is so important here. You're going to have this guy. And, and you know what? Jo Joseph, as he's getting this dream and he's hearing this, you know what he's thinking? Of course. He's starting to believe it now. Of course, I get it now, because we need a Joshua. We need a leader to come into our lives. We need this Joshua, this military leader, to help us settle some things. We need this. That's why we have to name him that. And it would have been, oh, yeah, I get it. We need this. You know, because you are going to give him the name Jesus. And... and he realizes it because he says the next word, because, because. And in Joseph's mind, you can just imagine him as he's sitting there in this dream and he's having this discussion maybe with the angel. And he goes, yeah, I understand why. Because for the hundreds of years now, all we've been getting is oppressed. It started off with the Assyrians. And then it moved on to the Babylonians. And the Persians came into the scene. And then the Greeks. And now we have these dreadful Romans and yes, we need a Joshua. I know why the Messiah is going to be born into this world. I know what he's going to do. And that's the whole idea there. And then the angel says this, because he will, in verse the, the end of this verse, because he will save his people from their sins. Because he will save his people from their sins. To which, if you're having that imaginary conversation between Joseph and, and the angel. Joseph's going, what? No, 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 no. We don't need saving from our sins. Hey, we don't need all that. There's a lot of things we need to be saved from, but our sins isn't on the list. In fact, he would say, hey, can you imagine this? He's having this discussion with his angel. He says, angel, have you ever seen Maslow, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs? It's not on there. In fact, it, it, if you've never heard this, Abraham Maslow came up and said, our greatest need is physiological. That means you need food. You need cake. My wife makes cakes, by the way. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you need food. You need water. You need su substance. You need air to breathe. That's physiological. Then you need safety. You need shelter. There's a storm out there today. You're going to need shelter from the rain, from the wind. I hear it's going to be getting bad. And then after that, you need love and belonging. We all need to fit in somewhere. And then it moves on to the higher levels where we need some esteem and some self-actualization. But, I, hey, angel, I don't see sins on there. That's not what we need saving from. We need all these things, but we don't need saving. In fact, 
If you didn't know, we have a system already in place for sins. It's a pretty good system, Angel. It's this temple system. Maybe you've heard of it. It's up the hill in Jerusalem. And, and, and what we've got there is a pretty good system. We don't need another system for sins. What we do need, Angel, though, if you want to know, there is someone who needs saving. And this is where he'd say, you know, Angel, what we need is there is someone who needs to be saved. Rome needs to be saved. You don't understand how bad they are. They've perpetrated crimes against all humanity. They have been dis despicable, disgusting. They have been the cancer on the presence of our world today. Rome needs to be saved. And you know what? We need to be saved from Rome. That's what we need. We don't need to be saved from sins. We need to be saved from Rome. And so what we need is a savior with a sword that's why we need Yeshua. That's why we need Joshua. We need a Savior who's going to come in and he's going to take us from. We don't need to be saved from our sins. Now, that's somewhat what we would think that maybe Joseph would have this argument with the angel, but he didn't. Because this is what I do know. That no one that ever saw an angel, no one that ever saw a likeness of God, any representation of God ever, ever argued with God. No one ever, if, if God was present, no one ever questioned God like that. And if you look through the Bible, you know that to be true. So when you hear someone saying they were having this discussion with God, they weren't having that discussion with God. They were having it with themselves. They weren't having it with God because no one ever had that. Because what we do find out down in verse number 24 is that when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And he took Mary home to be his wife. He, he said, as crazy as it sounds, it's got to be true because God needs it to be true. And that's the whole idea. See, that's the crux of what happened on that story. Now, let me ask you this question. This is the question I really want to get into today is, do you know why? Do you know why, as I went through that argument with Joseph the angel, that argument sounds a lot like people today in the 21st century. Do you know why so many of us aren't moved when we hear that God sent Jesus to rescue us from our sin? Because it's so important to this story. Because this is really what Christmas is about. See, you go back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And he says, you're going to give him the name Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua. Because he will save his people from their sins. And that's what we read. But you know what? For most of us who grew up in church, most of us in America, the, the Christian nation, you know what we actually hear? We don't, we don't read it this way. We hear it this way. You're to give them the name Jesus because he will forgive his people from their sins. And that's the problem. When we, we take it and we reduce Christmas to forgiveness, and that's not what Christmas is really all about. And that's the shame of today. In fact, Perhaps in your entire Christian experience growing up, maybe you grew up in church, perhaps your entire religious experience has been something basically that, like this. <sighs> Nobody's perfect, but God forgives. Nobody's perfect, but God forgives. Because we keep doing stupid, and God keeps forgiving us, and that's how we get. And that's really not true. That's a weak excuse for religion today to control us. And you say, well, what? This whole nobody's perfect, but God forgives. I'm not saying that it's not true that God forgives us. But that's not the point of Christmas. It really isn't. And I hope you listen carefully to what I, I, I have to say here. Because when we mess up, and that's what we do, we mess up, God forgives me. We mess up, God forgives me. I mess up, God forgives me. I mess up, God forgives me. And that's what drives us, and that's what drives church attendance, and that's why churches are empty now, because we get so tired of, like, I can't live the perfect life, and I keep messing up, and I'm tired of going to church and getting forgiveness. It's embarrassing, and I don't even know if it really works. And that's why churches are empty today, because that's how we think about it. Nobody's perfect, but God forgives. But the message of Christmas, the gospel story, is so much bigger than merely forgiveness. And listen carefully, because if you don't listen carefully, you're going to misquote me, and you're going to label me a heretic or a blasphemer, and that's not true, because I'm going to tell you what the Bible says here. See, the reason this isn't true is because Jesus came to deliver us not simply from the penalty of sin, 
or the consequences of sin. In fact, I would even go so far to say this. A lot of times, you don't get delivered from the penalty or consequences of sin. Hey, if you drink too much alcohol, you know what you're going to have? Cirrhosis of the liver. And you can pray all you want for forgiveness, but you know what? You're probably going to die without a liver. It's the truth. You smoke too many cigarettes, and you know what you're going to have? Cancer in the lungs. And that sin is going to lead to death. That's just the truth. And you can, be, you can get all the forgiveness you want for smoking or drinking or whatever. That's good. You should get those forgiveness. But you know what? God didn't come just to give us forgiveness. He came to give us the power over sin. That's the truth. See, Je Jesus came to deliver us from the power of sin, not from the penalty of sin, not from, not from just some mere circumstances. In fact, one of the great stories, and I didn't put this down because for time's sake, we would be here forever if I did that, but let me tell you a story. It's a story you can look up. John chapter 8 tells a story at the very beginning about this woman. She's caught, and it doesn't say exactly when she's caught, whether it was the day before, the night of, the morning of, but she's caught in the very act of adultery which is a very serious offense in, in that time period. It still is to, should be today. Um, our morals have really fallen through. But it was this, she's sleeping with someone she's not married to, adultery. And she's caught, and she's drugged naked. Now, it, it always strikes us as strange because she's caught by herself. I don't know how she's caught by herself in the very act of adultery. You explain that one to me sometime, and I'll, get, uh, I'll, I'll have better understanding. But she's caught in the very act and drugged naked through the streets of Jerusalem, rubbed all the way up through, and you, you know they weren't nice to her at all. They're dragging her naked all the way up this temple mount until they got to the steps of the temple, and they drag her up these step, temple steps because that's where Jesus is about break of day, 6 o'clock in the morning. He's having a Bible study on the steps, and they're doing this to embarrass him. And they cast her down in front of him and say, Ha-ha! Jesus, we caught her! Caught her in sin! And you know what the law says! The law says she has to die. We're supposed to stone her, and they all have stones in their hands, these big old rocks, not little stones, big rocks. We're supposed to stone her. What do you say? <laughs> to which Jesus has sort of ignored him a little bit. They've interrupted him and in what he's doing. <sighs> Jesus, just knowing, I, Jesus is so smart. He just knows that they're up to, to no good. They think they've got him. Jesus says something that's shocking. He says, go ahead. Go ahead. He calls her blood. Go ahead, stone her. <laughs> uh, can you imagine her? She's like, <laughs> what? She, I, I don't know if she expected that. She probably did, to be honest with you. She knew she was caught. She doesn't argue her way out of it. She doesn't make excuses. But Jesus says, hey, go ahead and take her out. You, first of all, I know you're not going to do it because you don't stone people at the temple. The law says you have to take her out of the city. So you take her out there to the, the stoning place just outside the city near the trash pile, Gehenna, and you find that hole, and you take her down there, and you go ahead, but I want you to do this one thing. The person who doesn't have any sin, you start it off. You start the execution. You throw that first stone. To which they all knew he had got her. They knew all the sins of their life. I don't know if God was working in their hearts to flash their sins before him or what, but they dropped their stones and walk away one by one. And it's gotten quiet, and she's still laying there in her shame, tears, scared. She's probably bloody from being drugged up the, the steps and everything because they weren't being nice. And Jesus makes a couple of statements that are, some of them are famous, some of them aren't so famous. And Jesus says, woman, where's your, where's your accusers? She says, they've left. And that's when he looks at her and says, neither do I condemn you. That's a famous one, by the way. Neither do I condemn you. And you know what he's saying? Here we are in the Temple Mount. The one person who has the right to stone you on this mountain, and I could stone you anywhere I want to, is me, and I'm not doing it. And that's amazing, and that's what we all celebrate, because that's a great thing. That's forgiveness, right? And he says, go, go. <laughs> and, and, and he tells her, hey, go, you're forgiven. But he says this, and it's so important. He says, go and leave your life of sin. To 
which we sit back and go, what? Can that even be done? Can, can I actually leave sin behind? Can I actually leave my life of sin? I, I, I just wanted some forgiveness. I didn't expect to have someone tell me I don't have to live in sin. Can we leave captivity to sin? Can we actually say no to sin in our lives? <laughs> you know, a couple chapters down in John, that was John chapter 8, John chapter 10, Jesus talking to the Pharisees, having to dispute with them. He makes a statement in John chapter 10, verse 10, at the very beginning. And he's, notice what he's doing here. He's talking about, and we always just assume it's all about Satan. He is referencing Satan, but he's really making a, com a contrast between the thieves of the ordinary day that the people knew versus himself. And that's what you need to understand what he's saying here. And he says, the thief comes only to do what? To steal and kill and destroy. And that's what he says. Hey, thieves, steal, kill, destroy. Steal, kill, destroy. But he says this. He says, I have come that they may have what? Life. Life. And have it to the full. That doesn't sound like forgiveness to me. See, here's what you need to understand. What, I, what I'm trying to get to in this is when we ask for forgiveness, forgiveness just brings me back to zero. For, forgiveness just makes me even in life. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, I'm just coming to bring your life back to the zero point. I'm here to give you way more than the zero point. I want you to live a life without sin. I want you to live a life that's full. I want you to live a life that's more. I've come to deliver you from something, is what he's saying. I've come to deliver you from something, not simply forgive you for something. And there's so much more to that, and I think so often we forget this. Over in the book of Romans, in chapter number 6, Paul gives a command here. And, and whenever you get a command, you've got to realize there's a choice to obey or not to obey. So he's given us a choice. And he's been saying a lot of different things, but in chapter 6, he's really fine-tuning what he's getting us to. And, and notice what Paul says in this area. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your moral body. Don't allow sin to be your king, your master. You don't need sin to reign over you. Sin doesn't have to be your master. And then he says this in the same verse. He says, so that you obey its evil desires. And you know what he's saying there? He's saying the same thing he told that woman in John 8. You have a choice. You have a choice. It's why Jesus came to deliver his people from their sins back in Matthew, right? It's why Jesus was the Savior who didn't come just to save for forgiveness sake. He came to save so we don't have to have a master over us that's an evil master, the master of sin. Jesus came to deliver people from sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 13, he goes on to say, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. If your entire, and, and basically I say this, if your entire Christian existence has been sin, get forgiveness. Sin, get forgiveness. Sin, get forgiveness. Sin, get forgiveness. Sin, get, that's great, but that's not what Jesus wants. You're, living, you're not living the Christian life. You're living way below that. You're not even accessing the gift of Christmas. And you've missed the whole point of what Christmas is all about. Because it's not about forgiveness. It's not. <laughs> forgiveness doesn't do anything for us that is great and extraordinary. You know how I know that? Because you and I can both forgive. And if we can do it, there's not much to it. I think we've missed the reason why Jesus actually came. Because he says this in verse 13. He says, but rather... Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And that's way more than forgiveness. See, grace doesn't make me even. Grace gives me way more than I ever deserve. And that's the blessing of God. In fact, he goes on in, in verse 14 and he says, For sin, and notice this, he says this great verse, For sin shall no longer be your master, in case you thought I was just making up. Sin doesn't have to reign in your life. Sin doesn't have to be your master. It's no longer in control. If you're in Christ Jesus, if you're a son or daughter of him, if you have that relationship, and then, just to make sure we get it, 
he goes to this summary of a verse that I learned when I was a younger person. Most of you learned probably in some kind of evangelistic course, but it has so much more meaning when we put it in context what he's actually saying. He says this in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. He says, for the wages of sin is death. And here's what you need to know about that statement. Here's what everybody knows. In fact, here's what people who don't go to church know. Here's what people who aren't even Christians know. They all know this, that sin kills things. Sin kills things. You know that. You've had relationships that got killed because there was sin involved. Maybe you've got, you ended up losing a, a spouse in a divorce. Sin somewhere got involved. Maybe you have relationships that have fallen apart from that. Maybe you've had other things, killed your job, killed whatever, killed whatever opportunity. Sin always kills because it's a biblical precept, but it's not just a biblical precept. It's a universal law. The wages of sin, the payment for sin is death. It always kills. And here's what I want you to know. Whenever there's sin, there's always something that dies. That's so simple, but it's true. And even forgiven sin kills things. And that's what we forget. And that's why it's so worthless just to ask for forgiveness all the time. Because Paul's saying, don't waste your time on just forgiveness. Because you get so much more with Christmas. See, Jesus came in the world not simply just to forgive us of sin, but to be Joshua, Yeshua. He came to be the warrior king to deliver you, to deliver me from the dominion, the power, the captivity to sin. That's what he came for. And that should be all exciting to us. But in our day and age, eh, give me some forgiveness make it easy. I'm not really even sure I believe the whole thing. And yet the message that the angel brought to Joseph, name him Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, because he's going to save his people. Not from the Romans, not from the, the problems of their life, not from the things that they really felt like they needed, but from the sins that were mastering them. And he says this in the, the rest of verse 23. He says, but the gift, the gift of Christmas, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And when he says that, what we have to realize is most of us, most of us, when we, were, we accepted Jesus as Savior, we grew up in these churches that the pastor or whoever told us like, hey, that means you get to go to heaven when you you're die. And yeah, that's cool, but that's not really what he's talking about here at all. That's not what Yeshua was going to do, just to give us a little eternal life. See, eternal life, this Christian life that we get, it's not what he's talking about, just this life in heaven. The gift that you receive when you place your faith in Christ is a gift that you receive right now is what he's trying to help us understand. And that's why Paul said, you don't have to be, you don't have to let sin master you. Sin is not your master. And the gift of God's life, that is eternal life, it frees us from sin's control. That was the gift of Christmas. Forgiveness for, not freedom from, is what we always go for. But it really, it should be the other way around. We don't need forgiveness for, we need freedom from. And only Jesus could produce, produce that. See, when I sin against Rob or when I sin against Audrey or whatever, I can get forgiveness from them. But it still has the power of sin over my life. And I don't need just forgiveness. I need freedom. And that's what the gift of Christmas is really about. The freedom of sin, the power of Jesus Christ. See, which means this. If you're a Christ follower, if you grew up in this whole failing, getting forgiveness, and then trying again, failing, getting forgiveness, and trying again, and you've gotten frustrated. You've gotten a little bit like, I don't know. I'm just tired of the whole thing. It seems like the same thing every week. Then you've missed out. And you're like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. You guys know that story, right? She had those walking around all over Oz with those ruby red slippers on. She could go home anytime she wanted. You can go home anytime you want. You can be free from sin anytime you want. You can say no to sin anytime you want, but maybe just like Dorothy, you need somebody to tell you 
So let's not. Let me tell you. Sin is not your master. Amen. Christian, you hear me? Sin is not your master. Sin is not your master. Lust is not your master. A lack of self-control in some area of your life is not your master. Alcohol is not your master. Prescription drugs are not your master. Your anger is not your master. Your jealousy is not your master. Your bad habit is not your master. See, Jesus came into this world to do more than forgive you of sin. He came in this world to set you free from sin. And that is exciting. That's a much better gift. Sin is not you either. You can go and sin no more. See, the truth in my life that I have to accept today, Christian, is I do not have to live as a prisoner to sin because sin is not my master. You can speak to me sin. You can taunt me sin. You can bait me. You can tempt me. But sin, you're not my master. Now, if you're not a Christ follower, if you're not a Christian, and you're here today, maybe you've been disillusioned with religion and, and Christianity, let me just say this to you. Sin does not have to be your master either. If you ever get fed up with you, and if you ever get fed up with something that seems to control you, if you ever get fed up with self-destruction that you bring on yourself and the self-destructive habits that destroy the relationships that are most important to you, I want you to know this. Christmas is a standing invitation from your Father in Heaven. And you've been invited into a relationship where sin no longer has to be your master because you're not under the law anymore. You're under grace. Amen. You're a candidate for the gift of Christmas. And that's why Matthew recorded this for us. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And that's what we needed most. We didn't need forgiveness. We needed Joshua, Yeshua, the warrior to come through and help us fight the battle that we couldn't fight so that we don't have to live under the master of sin. Because God, the truth is, wants to replace your sin with great joy. And those angels on that hillside, they came to those shepherds that day, and they told them of great joy, not because there was just a baby, not because it would be some cool event that we'd have a lot of Christmas plays and programs and songs and things like that out of. But great joy comes from a realization sin no longer has control over me when I'm a Christ man.